Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Once again, it's so good to be with you in God's Word, as always. And this morning, we get to the end of this glorious Gospel of John. So if you want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 21, and let's take a moment and go to the Lord and ask Him to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, You are the God who is on the throne, the Almighty, the everlasting God. The King of glory, Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, there is no one like you. And Father, we bow our hearts before you. We lift your name up this morning, Lord, because we are nothing without you. We thank you, Lord, that you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to become our Lord and our Savior, that we may not die, but that we have, may have everlasting life in you. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for us, for everything that you are, Lord. You are truly the great and glorious God. And so, Father, as we finish the gospel this morning, we want to pray as always, Lord. May you fill us with your spirit. May you empower us, Lord, to understand this message because, Lord, we want to be true followers of Jesus Christ. We want to serve you and know you and get to know you more. And so, Father, I want to pray this morning. May you have your way and may you speak to your children. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We are going with you also. And they went out and immediately they got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and a fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of his disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walk where you wish. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke saying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written 
Amen. Are you following Jesus? Are you really following Jesus? I mean, this is something we've talked about many times before. But today we want to look at what following Jesus Christ really means. Because following Jesus is what being a disciple of Jesus is really all about. It's about learning from Him. It's about listening to Him. And so really following Jesus has to do with obedience. It has to do with love. It has to do with trust. It has to do with the absolute total commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. So now we've looked at His death, His burial, His resurrection. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That changes everything. And we've seen the conclusion that's all about living a life of faith. But the thing is, John is not finished yet. I think this would have been a very good place to end the gospel. You know, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God. Wonderful place to end this. But John still has something important to say. John wants to talk to us about the restoration of Peter. You see, John has mentioned in this gospel, Peter's failure, how Peter failed. And now, you know, he wants to talk about the restoration of that. Because otherwise you would go on, you would read the book of Acts, you know, the next book, and you would see how Peter was mightily used in the first church, you know, and you would wonder, like, how could this be? How did that, this guy come to be this? So this is a very important topic to consider. You see, the Christian life is not only a life of faith. It's also a life of love. It's a life of transformation, and it's a life of following. So if you're taking note this morning, following the Son of God, and the first thing you could write down there is, following means obedience. Look again at verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. So now they are back at the Sea of Tiberias, or as it's called the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Gennesaret. And so the disciples had now gone home to Galilee. Because Jesus told them to go there. If you remember when Jesus met the other woman at the tomb, Matthew 28 verse 10, Jesus said, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And then we see verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and the others of his disciples were together. So we know that seven of the twelve disciples were fishermen. Amazing. And these guys were all together now, and they are in Galilee because Jesus told them to go and wait for him there. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. So this seems to be Peter's default setting. You know, whenever he doesn't know what to do, whenever he's confused, whenever he's tired of waiting, whatever, and there's nothing wrong with fishing. But Jesus told them that he's going to meet them in Galilee. Actually, he told them this the first time, right after he told them that evening, that all of them are going to be made to stumble this evening. When Peter said, no, Lord, even if everyone else will, I will not. That evening in Matthew 26, 32, Jesus said, after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So Peter is now in this place where he's not going to sit around waiting. He's uncertain of what's, what's playing out, what's going to happen, when Jesus is going to show up. Because the thing is, they didn't know when Jesus exactly is going to show up. Jesus said he'd go before them to Galilee. But now he's in the state of sometimes he appears to them and sometimes he just disappears. So they're like, we don't know when we're going to see him. And I think, again, it's about Jesus teaching them now to live the life of faith. Not a life by sight anymore, but walking in faith. And again, I want to say this clearly. There's nothing wrong with fishing. Fishing is a great thing. But when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he called them away from their fishing business. He called them away from the nets. Think back in the beginning, Matthew 4, verse 18 to 22. It says, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John's brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their net. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. You see, following Jesus means leaving other things behind 
to follow the call that Jesus is giving you. So when Jesus calls us, you know, he doesn't really just call us away from things because things are bad for us. What he really does is he calls us unto himself. And that call means we will necessarily have to leave some other things behind. We see that every time Peter went fishing after this, except when the Lord specifically commanded him, Peter caught nothing. You know, think about an earlier time in Luke 5, verse 4 to 8, when Jesus had pushed out your boat and he was teaching um, the people from the boat. Luke 5, verse 4 to 8 says, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partner in the other boat to come and help them. And as they came, they filled both boats, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. So the lesson here is God directed service. A huge difference that God directed service makes. God directed service is way better than our best efforts because following has to go alongside obedience. You see, earlier in Luke chapter 9, Jesus spoke about the cost of discipleship for real disciples. And one guy said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Another said, I will follow you, but first let me go bury my dad. The other one said, I will follow you, but let me first get say goodbye to everyone. And Jesus said in Luke 9 verse 62, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, even as Paul said a bit later in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, looking back at the old days, lingering on that is not walking in obedience. And the problem with following the Lord while you are walking in disobedience is it's affecting many other people around you. Look at what happens here. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. And they went out immediately and got into the boat. So this affected all of the disciples. Simon Peter was a leader. God wanted to use him for good things. And now he's leading the guys really not in a great way. So Jesus called them away from the nets. And now here they are, all of them fishing again, not waiting on Jesus, sort of trying to make ends meet by themselves. And it says there very clearly, and that night they caught nothing. Again, that's that lesson. One of the lessons we should learn, I think, the first time around is trying to do things in our own strength, trying to provide for ourselves, trying to do things ourselves. You know, didn't Jesus so clearly say in John 15 verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You see, as Jesus follows, we will do so well to remember this. Many Christians, unfortunately, in this world are on their own mission. They're doing their own thing, and they sincerely believe that they are serving the Lord, but they are actually doing everything in their own effort, by their own skill, by their own things. Other other Christians You know, they try to choose their own calling instead of just following Jesus in obedience, just listening to what he says and doing it. Look there at verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So they didn't recognize him, another one of those times. And so the point is, Jesus is always right there, even if you don't recognize him. Even if you're busy with your own little thing and your own little effort, Jesus is right there. And again, we don't know why they didn't recognize him. You know, it could be as simple as the fact that it was very early morning, you know, and he was sort of like a silhouette on the beach kind of thing. He was like an outline, a dark figure. Maybe there was a mist on the, on the sea that morning. We don't know what the reason was they didn't see him, but they didn't recognize him. They saw a person. And this is another 
lesson we learn right here. Because we don't know, even as, uh, as Christians today, we don't know when and how Jesus will show up in our lives. For that reason, we need to always be ready and we need to be walking in faith. Look at verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. So that's a typical question that you would ask a fisherman. Hey guys, caught anything? And then that answer that any fisherman dreads, well, no, actually not. Look at verse 6. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And you could just imagine like, huh? What do you mean the right side of the boat? What's the difference between the right side of the boat and the left side of the boat? I mean, we're talking about the width of that little boat. In a, any fisherman will tell you that doesn't make any sense. But real faith in God asks for real obedience to God. For full acceptance of and compliance with His will. You see, the Christian life is not, I did it my way. That's, that's not the Christian life. Following Jesus is about obedience, is about doing His things, doing things His way. And I don't think there's any reason in trying to find a symbolic meaning of the right side of the boat or the left side of the boat, you know. The difference really is working with God or working without God. It says, and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You see, what a difference God-directed service makes. It makes all the difference in the world. What we see here is miraculous. God-directed service. Simply doing what Jesus tells you to do. And the result is staggering. The result is rewarding. That's exactly why at Calvary, you know, we don't have all kinds of programs. We don't get into all kinds of gimmicks and fundraisers and things to do things. We simply get to God's word. We try to hear what God says to us in his word and we just do what he says. Simply teaching the word of God, simply, simply doing what God's word says. It's that simple. It's that straightforward, the life of faith. So Jesus here gave the disciples a command from the shore. A very nonsensical command, you must admit. But the thing is, they obeyed, and because they obeyed, there was instant and amazingly great success right there. Look at verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, so it's John now. John says to Peter, it is the Lord. So this is amazing, because as they are now pulling in this net, and they see the multitude of fish, you know, suddenly it just dawns on John. This must be the Lord. There's no other way that we can have such a miraculous catch of fish. This is God's doing. I mean, we toiled all night. We caught nothing. And it's that realization that it's not because of man's genius, not because of man's abilities, not because of some fancy program. It is the Lord. You know what? That's always been the story of Calvary Chapel, even from the early days. And I think even today, as we, as this Calvary Chapel Fellowship, you know, we are waiting in faith on God for our new venue situation. And soon and very soon, I hope that we will be in that venue, you know. And it's, it's just amazing. The whole thing is just such a testimony of God's goodness. You know, that place is amazing and it's got nothing to do with us. It's not because we are a great church. It's not because we are deserving. It's simply because it is the Lord that is doing this thing out of His grace, out of His goodness. And that's what they experienced that day as the net was full of fish. Let me ask you, are you hearing Jesus speak? Are you obeying what He's telling you to do? It's so simple. Just doing what Jesus tells you to do. For some reason, it seems to be so super hard. And so look what happens now. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. So Peter was working hard. He was busy with a job that he knew very well. He took off his outer garment, so he was pretty much in his loincloth. So he was working hard and sweating the whole time. And so when he heard his Jesus, he quickly put on his robe. And he just immediately jumped into the sea. The, the word is plunge because it literally means you just fall. You know, it's just like he just wanted to be with Jesus immediately. That's the thing. Because his real passion is Jesus. The moment he hears that Jesus is there, he drops everything else, including the fish, the boat, everything. And he swims all the way back to Jesus. Verse 8. 
But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. So these guys weren't even far out, as they were probably making their way back anyway. And it's so about 100 meters out. And so now the rest of the guys, they drag the net. They don't pull it into the boat. They drag it behind them as they come in. And then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. You see, Jesus already had breakfast ready. They were working hard for fish all night. And the moment they get to the shore, there Jesus is already at the braai. You know, fish ready, bread ready, everything ready just to eat. It's amazing. Look at verse 10. Jesus said to him, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So now he invites them to bring some of their catch and to put it on the fire with what he has already provided for them. The breakfast he already has ready. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. So Peter was a strong guy. You know, and the, the one problem with strong guys or strong people is they don't think they need the Lord that much. You know, when you are strong in yourself, you tend to want to do things in your own energy, your own strength. And you just go for it because you feel like, well, Lord, you know, maybe you can help me when I need you. But for the most part, I'm fine. Weak people, they realize the truth that they are dependent upon Jesus. So, so Simon was a big, strong guy. I mean, he was called the big fisherman in the legends, you know. And so think about 153 big, large fish and a wet net. So Simon just goes, he grabs the net and he drags it to the, to the land. That means like it must have weighed like something like 130 kilograms. It was heavy. And so why 153 fish? <laughs> well, we don't know. You know, it's true that biblical numbers do have symbolic meaning sometimes, but you can have a field day speculating about something like this. You know, I think about what some of the people have said in the past. Augustine said 153 is the sum of the numbers from 1 to 17. And if you take 17, it makes up the Ten Commandments and the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you're like, okay, I don't really think that's what it means. But, you know, you, you can probably make that application if you really want to draw it out. Someone said 153 is the added numerical value of the Greek words for Peter and for fish. You know, and you have all these explanations. Like someone said there's 153 languages at that time in the world. Someone said there's 153 races that must hear the gospel. Someone said 153 different kinds of fish. And you're like, whatever. That is all speculation. We don't know why. All we do know is they caught 153 fish. I think why we know this is because Peter is a fisherman. You know, a fisherman will tell you, it was that big? And I caught 153 of them. Peter counted them, okay? So always be careful of coming up with hidden meanings of the Word of God because that is mostly speculation. God's Word tells us certain things that we need to know. The things we don't need to know, God doesn't say. To speculate about it is to, go, to move into error. We should always keep the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. Look at verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. <laughs> and so Jesus says, let's eat, guys. And he invites them to come over for, to the breakfast that he has already prepared for them. And I just love the way that Jesus reveals himself to them this time. Again, it's so natural. He's absolutely divine, but he does it in such a natural way. He doesn't sort of hover over the dune like in a soft, warm, yellow glow with a halo. He's just like, hey, guys, let's eat. Come and have some food with me. That's awesome. And it says there, that yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. So also, as they're now coming from the boat, maybe the sun was still at the same place, you know, and they're not sure they know it's the Lord because John said so, because John perceived that in his spirit, but maybe they couldn't see for themselves yet and they're just not sure. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. Isn't this amazing? This is our Lord and Savior. The moment they come now, he starts serving them. He's serving them the bread and the fish, just like he served the multitudes, the 5,000 people, the 3,000 people on the mountain with the food. Now he serves them. He continues to serve. Verse 14. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So this is the third time that John records. We know there were some other times too. But number two, if you're taking note, following means love. 
Look there at verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Do you love me, Peter? You see, we know that love is the most important thing in the Christian life. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it gives us a beautiful display of God's love. Everything that love truly is, because love does no harm to neighbors. So followers of Jesus Christ, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to walk in in love. And Jesus now wants to restore Peter in that love. And because Peter publicly denied Jesus three times, now Jesus wants to publicly restore Peter again and make things right. Because we know private sins should be confessed and dealt with in private. It's much better that way. And public sins, on the other hand, should be dealt with in public, should be confessed in public. And so Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And that word for love that Jesus uses is the word agapao. That's that agape, the supreme and perfect divine love of God. And it's the highest kind of love that there is. He says, do you love me more than these? So, you know, there are so many good sermons preached on this passage of scripture about the these. But the question is, what is he speaking about? What are the these? And to tell you honestly, I don't know. It's not, it's not that clear. Some people say, when he's saying, do you love me more than these? He's talking about the other disciples. Because in his pride, remember that Peter said, Matthew 26, verse 33. He says, even if all these are made to stumble because of you, I will not be made to stumble. So it's the very thing in which he failed. He was confident and proud. Other people say that these things refer to his boat, his fishing business, the net, his career. But I don't think that his fishing business was really competing with Jesus because we see the moment that he sees Jesus, he just drops everything, jumps into the sea and swims to him. So what it probably means is, do you love me, Peter, as you claim to love me more than these? Because Peter claimed to love God more than the other disciples. And so Jesus is giving him like a retake and he's saying, Peter, do you love me as you claimed more than these? And because the issue seems to be right here, Peter, where's your heart? Peter, is your heart still full of pride or Peter, is there a change in you? Not that Jesus wants to know. Jesus knows already, but he wants Peter to know just like with us always. And so Jesus is now doing it publicly to give him a chance to think about, a chance to come clean before all the other disciples that are sitting there right by him. And Peter says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so now Peter responds, but the word that he uses for love is not the word agapao. He uses the word phileo. That means brotherly love. So when Peter replies, he says, yes, Lord, I am fond of you. Yes, Lord, I have an affection for you is what he's saying to you. A very humble answer now for a guy like Peter who was always on fire, who was always just in there first, putting his foot in and just going and doing. Something has changed in in Peter. There's now a brokenness in him. And and he's saying to Jesus, Lord, I hope I I love you like a brother. And then Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. So he says to him, Peter, I now want your life to be about caring for my people. Don't catch fish anymore. Feed my lambs. And so the Lord now commissions him. And it's very cool that Peter's not put out of commission. He's not put out of office or service. Just because he failed miserably doesn't mean that Jesus is now going to stop using him. You see, sometimes we mess up big time and we get totally discouraged and we feel useless in God's kingdom, but never give up on the power of Jesus to redeem and to transform your life. God continues to work in you. He who started that work is also the one who's going to continue and finish that work that he started in you. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? So again, Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you super love me like you said the previous time? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So again, Peter replies now with phileo. He says, yes, Lord, I like you a lot. Yes, Lord, I'm fond of you. And Jesus says to him, Tend my sheep. Watch over my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Be my under shepherd. Jesus gives him a commission, a calling right here. 
Verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, as Jesus asks him this the third time, Jesus comes down to Peter's level. He doesn't use the word agape, that higher love. He now comes down and he uses the word phileo. He's saying, Peter, so do you like me a lot? Peter, are you fond of me? And so Jesus asked him three times because he denied Jesus three times. And so that brings about a free, complete restoration. But it says here that Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? You see, it hurt Peter that Jesus would have to be reduced to come down to his level. Because yes, Peter wanted to say, Lord, I super love you. But now he lives in a realization of who he is in his humanity. He's not as great as he thought he is. His pride is gone. He's now been humbled. And, and he's grieved about the fact because he wants to love Jesus like that. He wants to be able to say that. You see, Peter wouldn't come up to Jesus' level and say, Yes, Lord, I got by you because he couldn't. Except if he was lying. Except if he was moving in hypocritical pride or something like that. And the thing is, we all grieved when we think about our human limitations. Aren't you grieved sometimes when you think like, Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to do things right, but why do I keep messing up? You know, this is Peter right here. And the thing is, God will meet you on whatever level you will be able to meet with him. But sometimes, tragically, you know, we limit the work that God wants to do in our lives because we refuse to rise to a higher level that God has for us. And so Peter was grieved by the three repetitions now and the last one Jesus bringing it down to his level but the thing is he is now being restored by Jesus and Peter says to him look at this beautiful Lord you know all things you know that I love you so Peter is now a completely changed guy this is such a humble answer for a guy like Peter there's no pride left in him in this moment you know Peter was brought to the end of himself and in his brokenness he was changed Look at his humility. And sometimes, unfortunately, that's what God needs to do in our lives. He needs to bring us to a point of brokenness so that we will come to him in honesty and sincerity, knowing who we are before him and recognizing who he is and recognizing that all our strength and all our ability really comes from him, that he is the vine and that we are simply the branches. So now after helping Peter to face his failure head on, Three times. Jesus now also gave him this threefold commission. Because here he says to him, feed my sheep. So he says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. So he's speaking about Peter, I want you to take care of all my sheep, the young ones and the old ones. Take care of my flock, Peter. And this is how Jesus now restores him to ministry. He tells him three times now, Peter, this is what I want your focus to be in ministry. And he tells him three times, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. I want you to take care of my people from now on. It's such an awesome responsibility to be an under shepherd of God, of his flock. You know, if God has indeed called you to that. Even as it says in Acts chapter 20 verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. It's a serious thing, a great responsibility to stand and be a shepherd under Jesus over the flock that he entrusts you with. You know, and I think that's the same thing on every area. You know, sometimes the choices I make People don't understand, but I don't make choices to please people. You know, it's the same with this venue thing. It's the same with the COVID-19 thing. You know, I'm not looking around and saying like, oh, that's what that pastor is doing. Oh, that's what that church is doing. Maybe I should be doing that too. I'm waiting on the Lord. That's all I, that's all I need to do. That's all I can do. I'm responsible before him for his people. So I need to hear from him. You see, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd John 10 verse 11, he is the great shepherd, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, and he is the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5 verse 4. So every pastor's responsibility is to listen to the chief shepherd and simply to do what he says. And that may not look exactly the same for every pastor. 
Everyone has gotten different giftings, different callings. So the main thing is you need to hear what Jesus says to you and you need to do what he tells you to do. Because that's the way that we show him we love him. If we obey his commandments, if we do what he tells us, that's how we show that we truly a follower of Jesus. Remember back John 14 verse 21, Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keep them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You see, so obeying Jesus is the primary evidence that we love him. If you love someone, you're going to do what they ask you to do. And that means that we are truly his disciples. It's just a display of our love. It doesn't mean we need to work for Jesus to love us. Jesus loves us. But the thing is, if we do the things he tells us, it's just displaying, demonstrating the fact that we truly do love him as our Lord and as our master. So choosing to obey is really a key to understanding the spiritual reality of the scriptures. Obedience is what opens you up so the Holy Spirit can now come and minister to you and teach you the truth of God's word. So the love for Jesus Christ is the only real acceptable motivation for serving Jesus, for walking with him. Obeying the chief shepherd demonstrates that you love him and it shows that you are truly a follower of Jesus. Number three, if you are taking note, following means trust. So Jesus now continues after he's asked him about love and he says in verse 18, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. So when we are young, we do what we want to, pretty much, as most of us. But now he says, when you're old, things will change, Peter. Jesus now telling him about his future. And, you know, he seems quite vague in what he's trying to say. So John makes sure that we understand. He tells us exactly what it means there in verse 19. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. So Jesus was telling Peter that he would be crucified one day. Wow. He spoke of a time when another person would bind him and carry him to a place that he doesn't want to go. It says a place where his hands will be stretched out. He's speaking about crucifixion. And he's basically saying to him, Peter, you will die on a cross. We know that Peter previously told the Lord Jesus that he will die with him. But now Jesus says, Peter, you will die for me. But the thing is, Peter's death would not be a tragedy. It says there how he will glorify God. Peter's death will glorify God. Just like Lazarus' death glorified God. Just like Stephen, the, mar the first martyr, his death glorified God. And I want you to understand that we look at death as a bad thing. Because it separates us from people. But death is often used by God to glorify himself. God can use someone's life either to, to bless them miraculously to glorify him. He can use someone else's life in amazing suffering to glorify him. He can even use someone's death to glorify him. Ultimately, we live for the glory of Christ and whatever he decides to do with our lives is up to him. So we know that Peter was sentenced to die on a cross around about AD 64 to 67. And on his own request, he, he asked if he could be crucified upside down because he didn't want to. He felt like he was not worthy to be crucified the same way that his Lord was crucified. So Peter died the terrible death eventually that Jesus told him about right here. But look what Jesus says to him. And when he has spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Literally, Jesus said, Peter, you just keep following me. Fix your eyes on me. You see, because I think it's only when we've really dealt with the issue of death and suffering in our own lives, in the lives of believers, that we really get to a place where we can just serve the Lord, love the Lord, and be a true follower of Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's only when you completely trust God with your future, whatever that future may hold, that you are really following him as one of his disciples. Remember Matthew 16 verse 24 to 25, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will 
find it. You see, following has to do with laying down yourself, being crucified to yourself, really means trusting God. And trusting God takes faith. And sometimes trusting God takes time. And eventually, after many trials, after many tribulations, you get to a place where you just know. You just trust God because you just know Him. You know who He is. You know who you are in Him. And you know no matter what happens, you will follow Him because you know Him. It's like Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 12 to 13. He says, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, it's like Pastor Chuck often used to say, one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So now Peter's walking with Jesus, following him, and he hears probably something. He turns around and he sees John, you know, and Peter was doing so well at this moment. You always think like, oh, Peter, you are, you are, you are really doing so well. Look at verse 21. So Peter, seeing him, says to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Okay, Lord, I hear you, but what about John? What's going to happen to John, Lord? You see, and this is a chronic problem, I think, for disciples of Jesus, oftentimes. Being concerned with other believers' walks with the Lord, being, you know, comparing ourselves to other believers, like, oh, look what's happening in that ministry. Look what's happening in that believer's life. Oh, he is so blessed. Oh, that's going so well. Oh, he's doing that. I should be doing that kind of thing. We so often want to compare ourselves and be concerned more with our brothers and sisters than we are really concerned with our own relationship with Jesus. You see, following Jesus means trusting him. And what trust means, it means I'm not looking around at everyone else to try and figure out what they are doing. I'm simply going with what Jesus tells me to do. You know, I remember when my kids started school, you know, in the beginning, all of them, you know, we, they would start with athletic season and all the kids would do, you know, the, the running. And as they all would get ready on their marks to run, I told them beforehand, I said, kids, when you run, I'm going to stand behind the finish line and you look to me and you run straight to me. Don't look around at the people running next to you. Don't be concerned if this guy is ahead of you or behind you. Don't worry because if you run like this, you know what? You completely lose speed. You lose focus. And my kids would run and they would, they would like run straight into me. And they did really well because they were focusing. Other kids were like, you know, were running and they would just like look next to them and they would get totally distracted by what's going on around them. Look at verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus saying, Peter, that's none of your business. You know, Peter, I might have something completely different planned for John than I have planned for you. And what does it have to do with you? My plans are my plans. He says to him, Peter, you follow me and leave the other disciples alone. Leave all the other followers because they will all be following me too. And some of you might need to hear that this morning. Like the other Christians, the other followers of Jesus, leave them alone. That's not your business. Your business is following the Lord. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Run your race with endurance. Even as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 verse 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We run the Christian life not by looking at our brothers and sisters, but we look to Jesus. You see, following Jesus means trusting Jesus with your own life and with the life of fellow believers. And the thing is, you'll never get discouraged when your eyes are fixed on Jesus. The only way we get distracted and discouraged is if we look 
at other believers and we compare our situation, our life, our ministry, our gifting to them. And we say, well, oh, I wish I had that. I wish my life was like that. No, focus on Jesus. You know, what I found is the Lord wants to deal with each one of us personally. He's a personal God who wants to stand in a personal relationship with us. He will tell me about my life and he will tell you about your life. And I never take it very serious when people come to me and say, well, I just have a word of the Lord for you. I feel the Lord's telling you to do this or to do that. I'm like, no, you know, the Lord didn't lose my number and I take it. I'm like, okay, let's see if the Lord says something to me. But if I don't hear from the Lord personally, I'm not going to be upsetting my life by what you think I should be doing. But as it turned out, John lived longer than all the other disciples. He outlived them all. And you could say that he did witness the Lord's return in the sense when he saw the visions, he was the one who wrote the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he saw all these visions and he saw the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there was a way in which he saw the Lord's return. Look at verse 23. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Now this was before social media. <laughs> this was before all the rumors and the fake news spreading like wildfire. You know, don't forward that message. If you don't know, absolutely, that is the truth. Isn't that one of the biggest messes we have in our world today? Social media is directing the world. And it's, a lot of it is fake. A lot of it is false. It's not even the truth. But it's forming opinions. It's shaping cultures. It's crazy. Social media is a dangerous thing. So now John, what he wants to do is he wants to correct this misunderstanding so people don't think what they should not be thinking because it's a foolish rumor. Look at what he says. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Assumption. Again, we talked about assumption last week. Remember? So John points out this is not what Jesus said. The real question is, what did Jesus say? You see, that's the question. Jesus was saying to Peter, Peter, take your eyes off your brother and put your eyes and your focus on me. Verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So John says, that's me. I've been that other disciple, this disciple whom Jesus loved. That's me. I've given you a true and an accurate testimony on account on all these things as I saw it. Remember, John was an eyewitness. He physically witnessed all these things with his own eyes. He didn't hear something that's from someone else who heard it from someone else who heard it from someone else. He was there himself, a first-hand witness. Verse 25. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the book that would be written. So many other things, John says, that I could have written about. There are innumerable things that Jesus did, so many things, much more that I could mention, but that was not the focus of this gospel. We know, we read last week, John 20 verse 31. He says, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. So now the book ends with Peter and John following Jesus. And we pick up this story in the book of Acts as we continue the next book in the Bible. We see both of these guys powerfully used as they are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Because they obey Jesus, because they love Jesus, because they trusted Jesus, then they were completely transformed by Jesus. They were used mightily in the kingdom. And as true followers of Jesus, they were instrumental in the transformation of countless lives of people who came to believe and to trust in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Let me ask you, are you really following Jesus? You see, being a follower of Jesus Christ is a glorious thing because Jesus came to this earth, the Bible tells us, to save and to give eternal, abundant life to those who are saved. Even as we read in John 1 verse 18 in the beginning, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, that is Jesus Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And now, 
to all those followers of Jesus Christ, to those who follow him, the Bible says to us so beautifully in Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 7, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Even as the last word of this gospel says, so be it. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you praise and glory and honor this morning, Lord, for your word that is so clear. We want to praise you for the gospel of John, for what you have done and what you are doing in the lives of your disciples. Lord, we desire to be true followers of you. Lord, we desire to walk in obedience. We desire to walk in love. We desire to walk trusting you every step of the way with our complete future unto eternity. Thank you, God, that you are faithful, that you never fail, that you always do what you say. Thank you, Lord, that your word is always right and true to the very end. It will be proven true. So, Father, I want to pray, may you continue to transform our lives, that we may truly reflect you, Jesus, to the rest of this world. As we follow you, that we may also inspire other followers, other people to start following alongside. Lord, we thank you that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, you are the one who began this work in us and you also one who will complete this work. We thank you for a finished and perfect salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you came to this world in the flesh, in Jesus, because you loved us, because you wanted to restore us, because you wanted to have us with you. So, Father, we praise you for your word. May you have your way in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you just have such a wonderful week. It's always sad to finish a book because of the marvelous things that we learned together. But may you now go into the week. May you truly seek the Lord and be a follower of Jesus. Just as simple as straightforward. Obey Him. Love Him. Trust Him. And see how he transforms your life. May he fill you with his spirit and may he use you greatly.